John has been talking about the eternal life that's available to us through the Son and the confidence that we have when we are connected to God through Jesus. This next section is going to develop these themes a little further. These things I wrote to you, perhaps referring to the whole letter so far, perhaps referring to the whole letter. In Greek, you would use the aorist tense, even if you're referring to the one you're writing right now, almost certainly not referring to some previous letter. These things I wrote or I'm writing to you, why? So that this happens. So again, we have the problem of we know that it's a henna, therefore it's a subjunctive. That looks like a subjunctive ending. However, does it come from oiga or does it come from horao? So we've gone through this before, but let me do it one more time. This word in the aorist is adane. And when you unaugment it, it's this stem, which is what you see. This word in the aorist is adon, and when you unaugment it, it's id. So this stem here is exactly the same as this stem, which is the same as this stem. How do you know if it's this one coming from oida or this one coming from horao? And the way you figure it out is you ask, is this the augmented version? In which case it's this one. Or is it the unaugmented version? In this case, it's this one. So this one must be the unaugmented because it's a subjunctive, and we know that because of the hina and the subjunctive ending. So this has already been unaugmented. It must be this one, unaugmented from this one, coming from this one. So we now identify that the verb is this verb, not that verb. So. These things I'm writing to you in order that you know, not in order that you see. Now we could have just kept reading and we would have reached the same conclusion. In order that you know that you have eternal life. Now, he's gonna qualify who's the you. These things I have written to you namely to these people, to the believing people. This is the present participle. It looks like a third person plural indicative ending, but that's an identical ending that you're gonna get if you take pistion, and then the genitive singular is ontos. Now we know the stem, and then you put the date of plural ending on it, pissed you aunt plus sin, that's the date of plural ending, the S makes the dental go away, the S makes the liquid uh, consonant go away, and then it adjusts the vowel yet because of that, and so you end up with the date of plural ending that actually looks exactly the same as if this were an indicative verb. But we know that it's the data plural here because we see the article in front of it. So this is a participle. These things I am writing to you so that you know that you have eternal life. To whom am I writing? To the ones believing in, or believing into the name of the Son of God. I'm writing to believers, okay? And this is the parousia. Fourth time I think we've encountered this word. This is the confidence. And this is the parousia that of which we have in his presence before him. We have this confidence before God. Now we've seen already the confidence before God is a confidence in the day of judgment. But it's also a confidence that allows us even now to boldly approach God and make our requests known to God, which is what he's going to talk about now. And this is the confidence which we have before him, namely that, so which is the confidence? It's that if we ask, subjunctive because of the eon, 
if we ask something, or request something, anything, according to his will. So this is one of a very few places in scripture where it's made explicit that God isn't going to answer every prayer that we come up with. He's going to answer the ones that are according to his will. It doesn't show up very often. Here it does. It does in Gethsemane. If it be your will, take this cup from me. Uh, I think it's implied everywhere. God will normally choose not to do the things that he, God knows are not part of his best plan for us or for our world. I think there might be times where God will relent, will give in to our persistence. Uh, we get examples of that in the Old Testament for sure. Uh, I think we should be cautious not to assume that it was a good thing if we manage to outlast a reluctant God and get God to do something that God didn't really intend to give us. Uh, sometimes that's declared to be a victorious prayer. I think it just might be us insisting on our own way rather than being willing to accept God's way. So if we ask for something according to his will, then what is the we know? Okay. This is the paresia. We have the confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, then he hears us. This is the confidence we have, namely, that he hears us. Condition, if we ask for things according to his will. And if we know that he hears us. Uh, so again, akuo takes the genitive if it's the person heard, even though it takes accusative for the thing that we hear. We hear something, it's accusative, we hear someone, it's genitive. So if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, this would be called an accusative of respect in, in Greek, uh, Greek 3, we're going to look at all the different uses of the accusative. With respect to whatever we ask. Okay. In, in relation to this. It doesn't really grammatically connect to the rest of the sentence. If we know that he hears us, whatever we're asking about. So, ha on whatever we request. Then, we know that we have this from him. So what is this? Now we're going to see that again uh, John uses this uh, what's called the, the cognate reduplication. He uses the verb and then the noun with exactly the same stem. So the itemata would be the requests and to request is itel. So you request a request. In English, we would say you request something, or you say you make a request. We would never use the same word in both the, the verb and the object. We don't ever request a request in English, but you do in Greek. So, uh, we know that we have the requests which, relative pronoun, we have requested. So this lengthening A is the reduplication. There's the K-A, so this is a perfect, the requests that we have requested from him. So this is all about the confidence. If we have, if, if we're in relationship with God, we have all sorts of confidence. We have confidence in the day of judgment, but we also confidently bring our requests to God, assured that if it's according to his will, he's going to meet our requests. But... Exactly that is what we sometimes don't know. So we make our requests, and we always, at least in our attitude, make it conditional upon whether or not that corresponds with the will of God. If it be your will, this is my request. And we're confident that if it is God's will, God will do it. So it's not so much that our prayer makes all the difference in the world, though sometimes it may well make a big difference. It's rather God is working out God's purposes. So we pray in order that God will continue to keep on working out 
what God intends to do in this world. We're going to keep going up to here on this recording, and then we have one left to finish the chapter. If someone sees, so now we have this aid on, unaugmented, it becomes id. So remember on the previous screen, we distinguished two different stems that are eid. Only the word horao will ever give you the unaugmented form id. So this is not no, it's see. We know it's unaugmented because it's a subjunctive after e'an. So, if someone sees the brother of him sinning. So, this participle ending agrees with the accusative singular ending here, but it's not attributive. It's not the sinning brother. It's you see him sinning. We see him when he is sinning. It's adverbial because it relates to the seeing. What are you seeing at the what time you're seeing it? If anyone sees his brother sinning, notice, a sin. We never do that in English. We don't sin a sin. We sin or we commit a sin. You just don't want to be redundant. Uh, Greeks obviously loved it. We've seen five or six different examples. Sinning a sin and conquering a victory and uh, asking a request and announcing an announcement. So we often have these verbs and the direct object uh, with the same cognate. So here he's sinning a sin. If somebody sees his brother sinning a sin, not to death. This is going to introduce a kind of a difficult uh, issue in interpreting John. John is going to argue that there's two kinds of sins. There are sins to death and there are sins not to death. And we treat them differently, and there's different outcomes for them. So we're going to first read the grammar, and then we'll puzzle a little bit what he has in mind and what we can learn from that. So this is the first kind. This is the not-to-death sin. Well, there's no verb, so how do you know whether you should use an ou or a may? Uh, here's another example of a may that was used where it could have probably been an ou. So this is a not-to-death kind of sin. Okay, what happens if the brother sees a sin, a, a person sinning a not to death sin? This is the lesser sin, apparently. What will he do? He will ask, probably implying he should do it, but it's just a future indicative. He will ask God, presumably, and he will give, presumably that's God will give. He will ask of God and God will give. So he's an intermediary. He's asking on behalf of someone else. He will ask, and God will give to him, to the sinner, life. Now, I don't think this means through our prayer we can bring about salvation of somebody else. This is a brother. This is a brother sinning a sin. And we're intervening with God on, our, on, God, on his behalf to ask God to give him life. Now, he's going to have to cooperate. If he doesn't want to be confessing his sins... Our intermediate or mediation is going to make the difference. People can remain unrepentant. But this is a, a situation where we're, we're working together with someone, we're praying together with them, we're leading them to accept the forgiveness of God that God offers when we confess sin. Uh, it could be that he here is not God, but you, the brother, you become instrumental in bringing life to that other person. If it is that, it's still eternal life, it's still God's life, it's still the life of God. It's not our doing. But we ask and we give, or we ask and God gives. Uh, I think I prefer to say God gives, although I know my Greek teacher argued that it was humans who pass on God's life to each other. So, what do we do if someone sins a sin and isn't to death? We pray on their behalf. We presumably are in contact with them, and we ask God to provide them the life that they are squandering by living in sin. Now, he's going to clarify. He will give life to him. To who? Now he pluralizes it. To the ones sinning not to death. So this only applies for the not to death kinds of sinning. 
to see your brother sin a sin that isn't to death, pray on their behalf. You'll be instrumental in bringing life to them if the sin wasn't to death. There is another kind of sin. Estin hamartia to death. There is such a thing as a sin to death. In other words, that's the other kind. Not concerning this. This sin. This is feminine. That's feminine. Not concerning that kind. I am saying that you should ask. So I'm not telling you to ask God to give life to the one who sins to death. I'm only asking that, I'm, I'm telling you to ask God to give life to the one who sins, not to death. Because there's two kinds, sin to death, sin not to death. So the grammar here, not concerning that sin, that kind of sin, I say that he should ask. Hina, with the content, not, not purpose. Uh, so this is the subjunctive, it's the unaugmented aorist. There's the aorist, there's the subjunctive ending. Okay. So now we've been told when it's a sin to death, I'm not, I'm not telling you to do anything. It's a sin not to death, he'll ask and he will be given life. All unrighteousness is sin. We've seen that before. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not. To death. Even though all unrighteousness is sin, some of the sins don't lead to death. If that's what it means, a sin not to death. But the implication then is, and some of them do. If it's one that's not to death, go ahead, intervene for someone else, pray for them. If it's a sin to death, nothing you can do. So that's theologically problematic. It's not that it's unprecedented in Scripture, it's just we don't know what to do with it. In the Old Testament, you have a distinction between inadvertent sinning and sinning what's called with the high hand. Sinning with the high hand. So if you inadvertently sin, of course there's forgiveness for you. If you sin with the high hand, in other words, you premeditate an act of sin and carry it out, well, there's no sacrifice for that. That's what it sounds like. Except, how can that be true? Almost every sin for which people bring a sacrifice was to some extent, premeditated. Do uh, you think David didn't premeditate committing adultery? Maybe he didn't think about it very long before he summoned Bathsheba to his bedroom, but he certainly did plot the death of her husband. That was premeditated. And yet, he receives God's forgiveness. So even though there are plenty of sins in the Old Testament which are clearly premeditated, sins with the high hand, of the worst sort, including murder, that seem to be forgiven, Yet, the Old Testament makes this distinction between the inadvertent sin and the sin with the high hand. Maybe all sin can be forgiven, but if it's that kind, there's not a lot we can do. God's going to have to really, utterly transform the heart of this person before anything can change. Whereas here, it's more a matter of, oh no, is that really what I did? So, in other words, we can lead them back to faithfulness more readily if they weren't really planning this uh, disobedient act that they actually committed. Maybe that's the difference. Now, we do have a New Testament distinction between the unforgivable sin and all the rest. That one seems to be very narrowly prescribed. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is itself a significant question. What in the world is that? Uh, but this text kind of seems to divide sin into two groups, not one against all the rest. So it's not really all that clear how we should understand this. I'm going to propose that since we can't really know whether any particular sin falls into the category of a sin to death, rather err on the side of always caring, always praying for, always finding opportunities to lead people back to repentance and back to life. If God knows that there's nothing we can do, well, then nothing presumably is going to happen, but I don't think we can know that. And so we do the best in pastoral care that we have the opportunity to do. All right, that leads us to the end of verse 17. 
one more video and we've finished the book.